the unmet need for a Nash therapeutic or a MASH therapeutic using the new term atop, new terminology, metabolic associated steatohepatitis is really, really monumental. It's huge. You know, if you look at where we are from an epidemiologic perspective and uh, look at the prevalence of fatty liver in our country, if you look at some of the broader studies that have been done, uh, it's around 30%, 25 to 30% of the U.S. population has fatty liver. <laughs> when you drill down more specifically uh, on studies that have looked at this in more detail, uh, I led one of those published in the Journal of Hepatology in 2021, where I looked at 664 patients presenting for routine colon cancer screening. Now, you're too young to know about that. But the guidelines suggest that if you're over 45, you should have your colon evaluated for colon cancer, regardless of whether you have symptoms, bleeding, or whatever. And so these people came in, they were generally very healthy. They just wanted to know if their colon was okay. And I asked them, would you like to know your liver health at the time you're coming in for your colon health? And, and so we signed up 664 of these patients and we use what we call the gold standard for identifying fat in the liver. That's an MRI, proton density fat fraction, or MRI PDFF. And there we found that 40% of the population, 38% actually, of the population had fatty liver. Now, this was a middle-aged group of Americans, not the whole population from, you know, cradle to grave, but a middle-aged group of patients. Parenthetically, that's who presents with NASH, by the way. We found the prevalence to be 38%. Now, when we stuck a needle in their livers, and, and, and that's what you have to do to, to identify NASH histopathologically, and that's why the study like we're talking about today had a liver biopsy requirement to get into the trial, and then a liver biopsy requirement to get out of the trial, and the primary endpoint was one based on the liver biopsy. We found the prevalence in, in that trial to be 14%. 14% of U.S. population, middle-aged Americans, have NASH. Now, that's broader than, than all comers, right? So I said all comers, uh, the thought is around 25% have fatty liver, around 5% have NASH. But really in the target population, the target population we enrolled in this trial, we see that the prevalence is more like 38% for fatty liver, 14% for NASH. And, and, and amongst those, around 5% had significant fibrosis on liver biopsy. Now, if you model this and you say, what is likely to happen with this disease today? And then let's fast forward to 2030, for instance. This disease is mirroring the trend in obesity and diabetes, where we're seeing increases in both of those metabolic uh, diseases. And so this is just kind of following along with that. And while we have treatments for diabetes and we have treatments for obesity, we have no proven therapy for NASH. So this is a huge unmet medical need and one that we are desperately in need of. It is a thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist that is very liver targeted and liver directed. And you might say to yourself, why are we studying a thyroid hormone drug in in the treatment of a liver disease. Well, this, this drug is very interesting. So we, what we know in the setting of fatty liver is that livers are relatively hypothyroid. There is an inability to convert the inactive thyroid hormone T4 to its active component T3 in the setting of fatty liver. And we, in fact, we get a buildup of reverse T3. So the thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist resmeterone, again, acts in the liver to 
uh, allow for T4 to be converted appropriately to T3. And, and a, there's a lot of different ways that that happens. But at the end of the day, what we see in so doing is also an ability for the uh, liver to undergo mitogenesis or what we call mitophagy. So this drug also induces new mitochondrial formation and allows for the improved um, beta oxidation of fatty acids. So you, uh, you get an impact on de novo lipogenesis, which is the formation of fat in the liver, and it also promotes oxidation of fatty acids in the liver. So in clinical trials in patients with fatty liver, in earlier phase trials, resmeterone has been found to lower liver fat, resolve steatohepatitis, lower LDL cholesterol, and lower triglycerides. Yeah, uh, so there, there are really a couple main takeaways from this very large, multi-centered, landmark phase three trial where 266 patients were, I'm sorry, 966 patients were included in this accelerated approval portion of the study where the uh, primary analysis was looking for NASH resolution with no worsening of fibrosis or fibrosis improvement by at least one stage with no worsening in the NAFLD activity score. Now on the first biopsy endpoint, NASH resolution with no worsening of fibrosis, we see that in the 80 milligram group, 25.9% of the patients uh, met that endpoint. And in the 100 milligram, group, 29.9% of those patients met the endpoint as compared with 9.7 of those patients in the placebo group. And this was highly significant uh, for both comparisons compared with placebo. For fibrosis improvement with at least one stage improvement with no worsening in the NAFLD activity score, in the 80 milligram group, 24.2% of them achieved that endpoint, and in the 100 milligram group, 25.9% did as compared with 14.2% of patients in the placebo group. Again, highly significant for both comparisons compared with placebo. Now, in addition, there was a key secondary endpoint here, and don't wanna gloss over this because uh, this has to do with uh, lipoprotein or low density lipoprotein cholesterol levels. And we know that lipoprotein metabolism is critical in the underlying pathogenesis of this disease. And in this particular trial and in other trials, 70% of people had dyslipidemia when they enrolled in the study. So looking at that, this is really important. There was a, a, a lowering in LDL cholesterol from baseline to week 24. Now, not week 52, like the biopsy, but week 24 of 13.6% in the 80 milligram group and 16.3% in the 100 milligram group as compared with 0.1% in the placebo group. Again, highly significant for both comparisons with placebo. Now, you have to kind of dig into the data a little bit more, but just to give you a little bit of perspective, what I just reported is ITT. That means intent to treat. That means if a patient got a dose of drug even if they never took another dose or they never had a liver biopsy, they were included in the trial. So another way to look at this is to say, of all the people that took the drug and had a biopsy at baseline and a biopsy at week 52, how did those people do? So Abigail, I'm glad you asked that question. So when we look, about 50% of patients treated with resmeterone 100 milligrams with biopsies at week 52 showed either NASH resolution or fibrosis improvement, meaning about half of the patients that actually got study drug and went through week 52 had either improvement in NASH or fibrosis. More importantly, more than 80% of patients with biopsies at week 52 had either fibrosis reversal or no progression of fibrosis. 
And I'm going to leave you with a quote, fibrosis portends a worse prognosis, right? The more scar, the worse off these people do. And in this trial, 80% of patients with biopsy at week 52 had either fibrosis reversal or no progression of disease. And the classic presentation, again, is a middle-aged American that has underlying dysregulated energy metabolism. Now, that's a big fancy phrase, but basically what that says is they have some sort of metabolism that, that's not functioning right, right? So they're, they're insulin resistant, they're diabetic, they're overweight, they're dyslipidemic, they're obese. Um, and, and so how does this population in the trial stack up to that? Very, very closely. So the mean age was around 55 to 57. The majority were female. Uh, and the ratio was like 60, 40, uh, 55, 45 ish. Um, the, uh, the, the majority were, were Caucasian or Hispanic. And we had relatively few African Americans and Asian Americans. Now, putting that in perspective, again, going back to the data I talked about at the beginning or other data in general, what we see is that this is a disease that's most commonly found in Hispanics, followed by Caucasian, Asian, and then African American. So generally speaking, the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, race or ethnic group to have this disease is African American, and that's what we see in our trial. And then the next would be Asian. We see that as well. So I think we're consistent with what we would see in uh, general population, with the exception that perhaps uh, we're underrepresented a little bit by Hispanics. Now, around 22 to 25 percent, 16 to 25 percent, depending on which arm you're in, were Hispanic. But potentially in the general world, it's a little higher than that. When we talk about BMI, BMI is 35, 36 in this trial. Again, we see this in an obese patient, so consistent there. 65% of the population is diabetic. That's, um, again, a little bit more than we see in the general population. But, Abigail, it's important to remember that we're not studying a mild population of patients. We're studying a more advanced population. <clears throat> when you think about F2 and F3 fibrosis on the spectrum, uh, F4 is cirrhosis, right? So we didn't want cirrhotics in the trial, but we wanted patients with moderate to advanced fibrosis. And in that setting, we see this degree of diabetes all the time in clinical practice. Same thing with dyslipidemia. So I think as a general rule, this is a representative population similar in disease severity as we would see in, in, the, in the community. And, and what, let me rephrase that a little bit. This population enrolled in this trial from a demographic perspective is very similar to the same demographic we would see in the general population that had this degree of underlying fibrosis, right? So again, just taking it into context, when we think about, um, about patients with F2 and F3 disease, again, 25% of the population in America has fatty liver, and you could argue that maybe 100 million Americans of those around 25% or 25 million Americans will have NASH. And of those, a smaller percentage will have advanced, you know, moderate to advanced fibrosis like you see here. So amongst that subset of people with moderate to advanced fibrosis, the demographics in this trial marry those very closely. Yeah, I think, you know, resmetarone has a good safety and tolerability profile. First of all, what I want to say is that there were similar numbers of serious adverse events across all groups. Uh, and when we think about what those adverse events are, again, reflecting on the paper, uh, the adverse events were uh, 
were most commonly diarrhea and nausea. It occurred more frequently in the resmeterone, resmeterone group than the placebo group. The onset of diarrhea and nausea occurred at the initiation of resmeterone. And interestingly, approximately 50% of the cases of diarrhea were described as worsening of pre-existing diarrhea or intermittent or loose stools. There were no episodes of severe diarrhea. And importantly, also the median duration was approximately 15 to 20 days, uh, independent of resmeterone dosing. Uh, so there's also important, it's important to point out there were no increases in bone fractures or fracture risk score with resmeterone or increase in adverse events related to thyroid hormone effects outside of the liver, such as heart rate changes or sex hormone abnormalities. Um, so I think that's, that's also important to highlight. I think the questions that, um, that, that might come up or where, where does this fit in the management of patients with, you know, with, with NASH and, and, and perhaps that, you know, that's worth a, a bit of a discussion. So uh, I thought a little bit about that because interestingly today, the, uh, the one of the weight loss drugs, Monjaro or Terzepatide, actually reported data in this disease in a, in a smaller trial, on a phase two trial, right, with liver biopsies. And it's important to realize consistent with the GLP-1 class of drugs, semaglutide, there's improvement on NASH, but they don't improve fibrosis. And remember I told you earlier, fibrosis portends a worse prognosis, right? And, and so here you have a drug in phase three that actually hit on fibrosis benefit. Uh, and in fact, I told you, Amongst those that took the drug and had a liver biopsy at 52 weeks, 80% of them had either regression of disease or halting of progression of disease. So when you think about how this drug, and, and I, this is something that, again, it's just my perspective, right? This is just me as a liver doc saying, how would I recommend using this, knowing the landscape uh, of what's out there, N not necessarily indicated for use in NASH, but we see, as I mentioned earlier, this disease is very closely linked to obesity and diabetes, for which the GLP-1 class of drug has the indication, diabetes and obesity, right? So I think, you know, look, uh, where th the question might come up is where do we use this drug? And I think it's, it's going to be approved for people with moderate to advanced fibrosis for F2 or F3 disease. So we, we need to uh, make sure that we're using this in the right patient population. We're not going to want to use it in a cirrhotic population, and we probably don't want to use it in people with no fibrosis, right? Because that's not what was studied. We want to try to stick with, with what was studied. And then in that setting, this is a liver-directed therapy. So if the concern is the patient is heading toward a un, un a liver outcome that's not, not that's not good, right? So decompensation, liver transplant, death, then then this becomes the therapy of choice. If on the other hand you have a little fat in your liver and you're obese and you're diabetic, this isn't the drug for you. The GLP-1 class of drug is probably the drug to start with. Having said that, I see a lot of people that come in already on GLP-1s and they still have issues with elevated liver chemistry tests, or in my opinion, based on other non-invasive tests, they still have significant scarring in their liver. This would be a case where I would add on to that therapy. 